Hello. So, hi. How's it going? I'm doing well. Yeah. Yeah, you've been watching any of the Olympics? Uh, you know, I don't have cable. So when oh. I go out to restaurants and things, that's when I see you the Olympics. I'm one of those people that's killing Peacock because I, I'm oh, just like not talk watching. Don't Peacock. <laughs> So these are the, you know, I'm not going to say these are the worst Olympics ever because certainly Munich in 1972 was terrible. <laughs> you know, 1932 with Hitler was awful, but they're bad because you can't watch the good, the good performances on like primetime TV mm-hmm. anymore. I will turn on primetime NBC and be like, oh, we just watched Nathan Chen. He's done. It was a fabulous thing. But oh. they don't give it to you because they want you to watch it on the streaming, the paid streaming yeah. Peacock channel oh. or whatever it is. It drives me crazy. I hope they figure it out for next time. Well, I think like, this, this is what work, they want. This didn't work, Peacock. Figure it out. They, they, I think they want you to pay. Well, obviously. You know, you know. <laughs> so the primetime's become like a relic, just unbelievable, mm. so bad. Speaking of paying, you're paying for your comments about the Olympics last time, Oh, aren't am you? I? <laughs> oh, my gosh. So if you weren't on the last podcast, I I, I was kind of mocking uh, curling, you know, and saying basically anybody that had a broom or a, or a mop could actually be a good cur- you know curler. And I got some feedback from people that were watching this thing, like, we need to have a conversation about curling. You I know? think we got to send you out onto the rink and we'll see how easy it really is. Well, I'm not, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying, you know, any any middle-aged dad looks like they could do it, right? In fact, those guys all look like they're middle-aged dads, don't they? <laughs> so I just don't feel like it's that big of a, you know, like, as an Olympic sport, I know I'm going to get more hate mail from my friends, but... <laughs> You know, it, it's so just, I, I, I don't get into it. You're, you don't Needless like watching it. But, and this is so wonderful, right? This is what makes the world go around. Everybody yeah. has their preferences and what they think is fun, you know, athletic and, and entertaining to watch. Yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. it's hilarious. I mean, some of the sports are just kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah. You know? so, yeah. Anyway. I did get to watch some downhill skiing last night. Yeah. Those, those are great. Night, which was really the awesome. The moguls. You yeah. know, I know I met Johnny Mosley and, you know, the, to see. The, you met Johnny Mosley? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah. What was he like? He's wonderful. Just really? kind and wonderful and, you know, friendly, outgoing. Great, That's great awesome. guy. Yeah. Just like you would hope. Yeah. Right. Very, very. Oh, friendly. how cool. Yeah. 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 Um, anyway, so welcome to A Place of Possibility. We're happy to have you here. I'm Richard Del Monte. I'm Angela Wright. And today, what are we talking about? We are talking about how to have a conversation with your spouse slash partner about dun, 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 money <laughs> and those conversations really well, as angela's gonna i'm gonna be interviewing angela um are really ideally done from any time from dating all the way through like if you're engaged all the way through if you've been married for 30 years yeah. right they're really important this is conversations. for everybody yeah and i a lot of people don't even have them because they're they're afraid to do it they don't know how to start them they don't want to broach the subject. They don't want to rock the boat. So hopefully you are going to shed some light on that today. I am. Yes, yeah. you are. Yes. We even did an episode, uh, episode 14, on if you already find yourself in conflict with your partner, go watch that first and then come back and, and watch this. And it's all about how to get through some of that conflict and have this conversation in a great yeah. way. You don't want to bring boxing gloves to this meeting, this this this, uh, this conversation. It's not <laughs> yeah. good. So we're going to make some, we're going to give you some tips today on how to make these conversations productive, how to have an agenda for the conversation so you stay on track. And we're going to give you some questions that you should think about that you could ask each other. Yeah. Yep. And we've seen couples that have done this really, really well and other people who have floundered and other people who have really <laughs> crashed into the rocks and not done it, done it very well. And we're going to share some stories about that. Yeah. And so this, this guy, the guy that, w- that we're going to be talking about, that Angela has written is, is on our blog and it will also be in the show notes from this. So you make sure you get that because you won't be able to get everything just from this conversation yeah. that you need yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, talking about money early and having ongoing conversations can actually be a bonding experience for a couple rather than something that sure. tears them apart. And, you know, it's never too late to get started if you miss the memo on talk early about this. And <laughs> yep. in fact, I encourage you to continue this conversation at least annually. So if you've been married for 30 years, you know, talk to your partner and then keep talking to your partner. Eventually, you may want to bring your children into family money meetings. Some people would do like annual family councils or family summit meetings and you just be really surprised what you learn about yourself and your family and your financial situation when you talk about all of this regularly. Yep. And you don't have to agree with your spouse or your partner on every aspect of this. But what's really important is you have to understand each other's perspectives and where you come from. That That's kind of the, the opportunity to be able to come up with a, a compromise situation that works and to draw you. If, you. if this is done right, you can be drawn so much closer, right, oh, to each other. Oh, totally. Tremendously of course. closer. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's actually wonderful. So, um, so I'm, Angela's going to be the uh, the person I'll be interviewing today primarily, and she has a wealth of information about this. You will not believe what she how how prepared she is and how much she understands about this. And you know, it's funny because her her background is um, when I first met her, she was very interested in this, and she's been developing her skills in this area ever since then for the last fourteen, almost fourteen years now, right? Yep. Um, and she has, she was one of, she was the second, third, third, uh, family enterprise advisor in this country. Uh, the family enterprise, uh, exchange, is that what it is? Mm -hmm. They are, they, they are, a uh, uh, Canada based organization. There's a lot of small businesses that are owned by families in Canada, right? And large enterprises. Yeah. Family owned. Yeah. And so Canada's got it, got it going. They've got it down mm -hmm. where they actually are prepared for this and they have they've trained a bunch of advisors to do this in America it's a little bit slower but she saw the opportunity and um, she's she's a pro at this yeah and managing a family enterprise is often about having communications about money and resolving conflicts around money so yep, pretty yep. relevant to this topic yep so uh, besides your FEA how did you get to be what brought you to this and how did you develop your expertise yeah personal experience and pain <laughs> so you know, getting a little vulnerable you know it, early on uh, in my marriage this was an issue and it was something that you know we we came to blows about often and I wanted to figure out how to make this work and have harmony around finances in the marriage um, sure. So I started studying it and interviewing people. And, you know, I think between the two of us, we've probably worked with hundreds of couples and families on this conversation. Um, and, you know, many, yep. many hours in our own therapy offices with our spouses and learning I have no about, comment about that. <laughs> learning about how to do it really, really well. Yeah, we could actually have our own MFP for the amount of money we <laughs> We spent on that on, on psychotherapy right over the years. Yeah, no wow. kidding. Yep, yep, yep. So <clears throat> Let's start off with how do how do couples, you know, get started having one of these conversations? They seem a little odd, you know. Like let's sit down and talk about money. Yeah, you know, well, it's like not <laughs> not you know the, the kind of thing you might normally want to do. So how do you get started? Yeah, and oftentimes your parents taught you not to talk about money. Mm. It's rude, right? And how? So yeah. So the first, I want you to think about creating a container and a foundation for having this conversation. So set and setting. So set is, you know, your mindset and the setting is where we actually are. So you want to find a time where you can be free of distractions. And that means, you know, kids are at, at school or in bed, pets are occupied, your phones are off, and you're just really focused on each other. Um, and some couples even set a time, uh, like a specific time to do this. So we have one family that does money day. Uh, and I just, I think this is so cute. So it's the 22nd of every month, they have money day and they sit down for about an hour. They pay their bills, they review the budget. Um, they, they manage their finances separately. So they settle up with each other and it works really well for them. And they just, everyone knows the 22nd is money day. It's so smart. It really is. do that, you know, and so forward thinking. That's great. Well, one of the things is that it gives them an opportunity to um, have this conversation without a approaching each other on the fly, right? Like, hey, I noticed you spent a hundred bucks on shoes. <laughs> that can be really, what? that can be, um, you know, confrontational, right? But mm -hmm. instead it's like, this is the time we talk about money because the reality is in our society, we need it to, you know, live. And it's just, it's something we have to do, right? Sure, sure. So, oh yeah. Yeah. So I was going to, what kind of questions are we talking that you should be discussing in these, in these? Yeah. Well, let me say, so I, so set and setting a couple more things here. So okay. have some supplies available. I highly encourage you to have snacks and beverages and Kleenex. Wine. <laughs> Wine. No, save the booze for after, <laughs> or maybe not. You know, do your thing. Um, pen and paper and have your computers or however you manage your finances available and then commit to each other in terms of this is about learning about each other's uh, ways of being with money, hopes and dreams and desires. And I wanna remind everybody that there is no right or wrong way to do money. There's only personal preference. So try to reserve judgment of your partner if they do things differently than you. That's really hard, especially when you believe that your way is right. And As we often do, of right. course, we yeah. all have an ego. Yeah. So open your mind and your heart and perhaps there's something for you to learn. Yep, okay. So the grist of it, uh, what kind of questions are we talking? Yeah, okay, so we're gonna start with an icebreaker. We'll just like ease you into this conversation. So what Good lessons idea. did you learn about money from your parents? So this gets at the foundation that we all have inside of us and the money values that were given to us. And I wanna remind everybody that they were given to you, right? And so if they didn't serve you well or they've created some bad habits, don't judge your partner for that, right? They didn't choose that. 
Um, and you can ask, what specifically did your parents teach you that helped? Uh, and in what ways maybe did they fail you around money, right? And mm -hmm. you know, you have just all sorts of stuff that we bring from our childhoods around money. So this is like setting a foundation with each other. Where did my partner come from regarding money? really great question you can ask is what does the word money conjure up for you um like maybe like what one word does does money conjure up? feelings some people just have feelings from yeah them, right? totally yeah. so like yeah. once we asked the client this and she said food which mm. i thought was really interesting and she went on to tell a story that you know when she was young they were very poor she had an alcoholic mother and the food stamps would run out every month Oof. and so there was never enough food she got a job at 11 years old to help make ends meet and her whole life she never spent a dime on anything other than basic necessities by the time she came to us she had enough money to spend more and she still wouldn't do it and so we for years we worked with her on this and you know huge victory one day she called and said I'm outside with a new car, please come outside. And it was a Mercedes. And we were so excited for her. It was just, you know, she had really shifted some of the poor habits that she had around money. Interesting. Other people have said what? No, just, you know, like I remember in my, my situation, you know, I, my, my brother and I were talking a few, a few years ago about how we grew up and our mother, the thing we got imprinted on was our mom would run out of money. My father got paid every two weeks from his job. And so we would run out of money on Friday and she'd go down and start writing bad checks at the grocery store, you know, and then when he got paid on Tuesday, she would grab that paycheck and run to the bank and deposit that oh, bank, wow. uh, yeah. you know, that, that check, you know, and it was because, so she, that was, you know, that was kind of her MO always mm -hmm. short, always short. And, um, and, you know, Robin Peter to pay Paul. Hmm. Yeah. So that was a very strong imprint for us that we had to overcome. I'll say, I wonder why yeah. you became a financial advisor. I know, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. Sure. It's, I'm sure it had a it had an impact. But this is all we we bring this to our to our relationships, right? And we we it's just our we're just it's our baggage, part of our yeah. baggage that we bring. I often hear things like um, freedom, reward, burden, security, control is control. a big one. Yeah. So, you know, just conjure yeah. up a word and then talk about how did this yeah. come up for yeah. you? And so you're yeah. learning about your partner's history and values around money. And it's a really wonderful way to set the stage for this conversation. Good, good. So uh, when you get done with this part, you're, you're going to have to start getting into the nitty gritty questions yeah. like the, the present day stuff, right? Yeah. So what are those, what are the most typical and effective questions that, yeah, you, so, that come up that people should be thinking about? Right. So starting with your household budget, how much money does this family or this unit of people need to survive? What are our combined household expenses? And so I encourage everybody to work on your budget before you come to this meeting, especially if you're new, like just moving in together or newly engaged. Um, do that before you come to the meeting and and compare your budgets with each other. And you can also talk about things along budget, like what level of spending are we comfortable with on certain things? Travel and gifts for other people, cars, clothes, et cetera. And I'll say there's a lot of conflict potential in that question, spending levels. So again, if you mm -hmm. find yourself on question two, <laughs> immediately in conflict, take a breath, take a walk, remember that it's normal to have conflict around money, and then check out episode 14 where we have some strategies and how to listen to each other and get past that conflict. Mm -hmm. If you struggle with making a budget, there are two um, web, web base or phone apps that I like, mint.com and YNAB, you need a budget. You can also use Cute. Excel and we can post a template in the show notes if you wanna just like write it all out. However you do it, doesn't matter, have it done and then talk to your partner about it. Great. What about the elephant in the room in many cases? Like should should spouses or partners combine their money or should they maintain their separate uh, oh, boy. You know, resources? Yeah, big question. Um, many assume that combining is is necessary. I mean, historically, that's what we've always done, right? Even, you know, if you think past, you know, like before, 200 years ago, right? We combined our resources to survive. And so a lot of that, you know, like when you first got married, it was just assumed probably that we'd combine our money and- Hey, wait yeah. a minute now, don't date me. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> Yeah, it, it was more common for sure. Yeah, but with the rise of two income households, we've seen um, that a lot of couples are separating their finances now. And it's really interesting. Um, so, you know, if you find that you're incompatible financially or you have a big income disparity, I'm going to go through some options of different ways that you could combine or separate your finances and you just choose what works best for you. You still, no matter what option you choose, you still need to coordinate your family budget and you know some goals for the future which mm -hmm. we'll talk about in in just a minute 
So there are five methods of manage, or that I know about of managing your finances. So I'll give you the list and then we'll dig into each one. So you have completely combine your finances, completely separate your finances, separate but equal, set percentage, and set contribution or set dollars, you could call it. So okay. let's dig into each one. Let's do that. All right, so completely combine finances. This is the traditional model. Everybody's money goes into the family pot, bank account, and that bank account is used to pay the family bills. And ideally, the family income covers those bills, you've done your budget, um, and, and there's a great, an agreed upon spending and saving budget. Done, pretty easy. <laughs> I yep. say easy, but you know, yeah. in, in completely theory. combined finances, I think that's where we find the most conflict because you know, you go out and buy a $200 pair of shoes and I'm like, Hey, wait a second, what, we, you know, we didn't agree upon that or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And, and everybody sees it all and you have a little bit less control over how the money is spent. Right. One of my things that happened to my wife and I, when we got married was we were, we were using, we thought it was the right thing to do to generate, you know, closeness by sharing the same checking account. Yeah. And so what happened was someone would forget to write the uh, check they wrote down in the, in the ledger or What's we had two different ledger? ledgers. <laughs> well, you know, back in the day, we had two different ledgers. Yeah. And um, and so we weren't updating them occasionally, you know, regularly. So someone would we'd say, like, we, bounce, we were bouncing checks all the time, oh, you know, and we were getting mad at each other and fighting and everything. We finally decided, okay, wait, wait, wait. You know, this isn't worth it. So we just got separate checking accounts. We're on each other's checking account, but we, like she's on top the name on hers, uh -huh. I'm on top in mine, and we've never had a problem since. I love that. It was and really modern technology simple. would have helped you guys too, because sure. if you could have seen it online. Yeah, but still, yeah. If, if, until they clear, you don't really know, true. right? So yeah, you that's can end true. up bouncing checks, yeah. yeah, not fun. Good, that's a good example. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so then the other one is completely separate. It, that's the 180 from completely combined. So each partner maintains their own budget, uh, their own credit accounts. Goals are sometimes combined, but not always. You know, two people can save separately for retirement if they want to. I see that sometimes when there's a big age disparity with the clients. Um, with this model, all you really need to do is decide who's paying which bills in the household. And often you see it like, I'll take the mortgage and the insurance, you take the groceries and the kids stuff and you know, done. Um, sometime, and then you'll also decide, you know, what, when do we combine our resources, if ever? Like maybe we each contribute to the children's college savings accounts or we each contribute to the retirement, which is a joint goal. It's just mm -hmm. lots of ways that you could do that, but there's no commingling of the money or the debt in that case. Then we have what we call separate but equal, and that's where each partner maintains their own banking and credit accounts, and they each contribute half of the household expenses. It's mm. just a really simple way of doing it. Um, it works well when the partners are kind of on the same level um, income-wise. And the most important thing to work out here is what's considered household expense and what's a personal expense. Mm. And like the possibilities are endless and how this is like whatever works for you, there is no right answer. Um, but often what we see is the mortgage, insurance, and like life insurance, disability, property insurance, uh, groceries, utilities, um, housekeepers and landscapers and the children's needs. And then separate things would be like cars, fuel, dining out without your partner, um, wardrobe. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> I was thinking more along the lines of going to lunch with your coworkers or something, not where your like, mind went. <laughs> no, no, no. I was thinking FOMO. Oh no, yeah, 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 yeah totally. Know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, hobbies, you know, you really like golf. That's super expensive. You pay yeah, for that for on sure, your own, yeah. whatever. Right. Yeah. Um, I've even seen travel fall into either category. Sometimes. Yeah. 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 Okay, so then we come down to the set percentage. This is my absolute favorite way of doing things mm. when you have a large income disparity among the spouses. And essentially what happens is you do the same thing in separate but equal. So you decide what's a household expense and what's a personal expense. And then you determine how much of each spouse's income we would have to contribute to the family household expense pot in order to cover all of our expenses. I'm going to put this to a numerical example for you. I think it makes it a little bit easier. Okay. So we have Jane and Tom. Jane earns $100,000 a year. Tom earns $50,000 a year. Their combined household expenses are $100,000 a year. So if they each contribute 70% of their income to the household, they'll cover their expenses with $5,000 a year left over. Some couples try to get that down to the dollar. Other couples leave a little bit of a slush fund and then they'll spend that on maybe something they wanna do to upgrade the house or a vacation or saving whatever, whatever they want to yeah, do with it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And so 
Then each partner gets to keep the remaining 30% of their income for their own discretionary spending. And what I love about this is that it feels really fair because you get the same percentage of your income, you know, snagged away from you into the family pot. And what I also love about this one is that as each person's incomes go up, the family budget can increase. There are more resources available to the family, but one person isn't stuck, you know, contributing more of their income. This works really well for people who are raised to believe that um, like equal is fair. <laughs> uh, like my sister and I were raised that way. Yeah. So, so I really love that one. I could see where you could also have a, a kind of a hybrid of that where every, each spouse ends up having $5,000 a year left over, right? No matter how much. So, so for discretionary spending, yeah. you just kind of level it out, yeah. right? Well, that's, so that's yeah. a set dollar method, basically. So instead yeah, okay. of taking a percentage of your income, you figure out how many dollars of each person's income that you have to contribute. I see. Okay. And then everything yeah, yeah. else is left over. And so in that way... Um, the family resources don't increase as you get raises. You're still contributing, you know, let's say your 50,000 to Jane in this case is contributing her uh, 70,000 into the family pot. And then as Jane's income increases, that's for her to keep. Got it. And okay. again, you know, there's a lot of values in here. Like you might be hearing this and going, oh, that's right. terrible. Yeah, yeah, Jane yeah. sounds like, a, you know, she's stingy. <laughs> again, it's like whatever works for you, right? And some people just feel like the control thing about their money. Um, or maybe their spouse is, spends more freely. We'll talk about that in a second. And so Jane might be saying, well, Tom spends really freely. I'm not going to let him, you know, yep. <laughs> spend yep. all of our money. Right. Um, Fritter it away. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, you know, you just figure out what works for you. Work. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So what about debt and credit? I mean, some people come into marriages with tremendous student loan Especially debt, today. you know, or other kinds of debts. Um, and some also come in with like hampered credit, right? They're, yeah. They've got a broken wing when it comes to that. They've had trouble managing their credit. So what, what, how does that work? Yeah. So this one is you know, the seems, cause of a lot of marital mm -hmm. fights. It's the cause of a lot of judgment in relationships as well. Um, and so look, the long and short of it is you are where you are and we're not going to judge our partner for what they've done in the past. So you're going Hopefully. to... I'm telling you not to Don't, stop doing that, please. <laughs> so, you know, you're going to look at each other's credit scores and credit history, like go, go online and print it out and discuss what went on and how much credit you have available to you. What is your, what is your score? And do you have a history of missed payments? And do we differ in our ideas about acquiring debt? That's a really important thing for people to talk about, right? Some people are we're taught, you know, like listen to a lot of Dave Ramsey, like never have any debt. Yeah. You know, I was taught that like, debt is bad. All of it is bad. Don't do it. And I was like, I don't know, 25 when I first started putting things on a credit card to get cash back. And even then I felt kind of uncomfortable mm. and other people are like, yeah, the money will come to pay it off. No worries. They're just more free with it. Again, both of those are right. <laughs> there yeah. is no judging each other around this. Um, you know, and, and FICO scores are important right? Because it will impact your ability to borrow. And so you just kind of make a plan on how you're going to do that going forward. Um, <clears throat> this is not a compare. So like, let's say one partner has a lower credit score or more debt. Perhaps they, you know, have a PhD and were in school for 10 years. I mean, it's really not a comparison of who has managed their money better. Stay curious, stay compassionate with each other. Um, it does need to be done. And this can, this, this one question can really avoid a lot of blow ups. In the future. And there's also a way for, especially if you're in a new relationship to, if you get the credit, look at each other's credit reports, you can find out if you're work, working with someone who's um, a crook, like someone's yeah. going to take advantage of you. Yeah. I, I know one, um, one friend who was in a relationship with a guy and he was like, he had a serial scammer scamming oh, people, getting with another gosh. woman, scamming her, leaving, scamming somebody else. And had she known that, all the, if he would have had all these debts on his credit report and everything, she could have saved herself a lot of heartache. Yeah. So that's, it's really good. And if they say, no, I'm not sharing with you, bye. Oh yeah, you know, yeah, I, I mean, think. There's only so much you can tolerate, right? Gosh, I, yeah. I mean, I would caution, it. look, I'm not your therapist, <laughs> but I would caution you, um, about entering into a relationship with somebody who isn't willing to share this with you with an asterisk in that if they have a lot of trauma around money in their history, like their family history, it might take somebody some time to open up. Or let's say they don't make a lot of money and they've been burned in the past by partners who want, you right. know, 
want a sugar daddy or whatever. Um, like people might not be willing to open up so soon, but they should be able to communicate that much to you, right? right. If you've gone through question one, you right. would get that and you would say, okay, what would it take for you to feel safe to share with me? You yeah. know, and, and let's set another time. Let's to talk get about there. This. Yeah. We'll go to therapy or something. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, what about people who are habitually like making late payments and stuff? Some spouses deal with that. You know, oh or, yeah. You know, yeah. Partners. Yeah. Yeah. What do you, how do you deal with that? It's tough. I mean, you have, so think in this case, I would approach your family, like you're approaching the operations of a business, right? Take, take the person out of it. I, I have a couple like this where the wife is, she's not a spendthrift, but she constantly misses payments. It's just like not thinking about it or the cash flow is kind of just not managed that well. And, and so, she, and her husband just goes after her. Oh, I can't believe you forgot to make that payment. Oh my gosh. And they fight, fight, fight about it. And so, you know, in that case, what they need to do is sit down and make a plan. They have a hole in their operation. How would you feel that if it was a business? What would you do? You might delegate that responsibility to the person who does it well. That's pretty That's obvious. One way to go. Some people don't want the burden of doing all of the bill pay for the family. So um, technology, auto pay on these bills is another really great yeah, way to solve missed payments. Sure. Yeah, like, great. That doesn't really have to be a thing anymore, missed payments. Auto pay. Yeah, right. Absolutely. What about the dreaded S word? <laughs> Spending. There's a minefield if there ever was one, right? Between in, in between partners. Oh um, yeah. How do you approach that in a way that doesn't destroy a relationship? <laughs> well, this goes back to the first question around money values. How does your and you'll get this really quickly, like how your partner feels about spending when you're talking about money values. And yeah, this is like answering this question again, like we'll save you a couple of fights a year and knowing where each other stands and how much we're we're going to spend. So something interesting, a favorite trick, <clears throat> excuse me, of salespeople is you've got one spouse alone in a store and in order to upsell you, a salesperson might say, well, <laughs> Richard, are you sure you don't want to ask your wife before you buy this car? What? What are you saying? <laughs> yeah. You need her. This is, watch when you're out. This is super common. And I, you know, don't fall for that trick. It's kind of a silly little tip, yeah, but. Good call. Yeah, um, but understand, I think the real issue around spending is people's ideas of big purchases, right? I mean, we have to we have to meet our fixed expenses, but then beyond that, how we spend our money is super duper important. So I would say, going back to the original budget, how much are we going to spend on vacations each year? Are we going on crystal cruises or are we going camping? And and if you differ, you have to find a way to compromise. Right? Depends on how sick I want to get. <laughs> oh, <gosh. laughs> yeah, no kidding. We're not. Uh, yeah, I guess we're not talking about cruises. Like we're not yeah, talking about Bruno yeah, anymore. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but you know, for some couples, it's like a hundred dollars. If you're going to spend more than a hundred dollars, talk to me. You know, I, like personally, I could go a couple hundred dollars on a discretionary. You want a really nice pair of Tom Fords or something? Knock yourself out. Like, what's yours? You guys have one? I don't know. More like, you know, a thousand dollars probably. Yeah. 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 So you have your regular expenses. Those are things that are expected. Like managing your partner's expectations is super important here. And then beyond that, you just like, hey, honey, you know, I we need a new um, air filter, like air fan filter for the house. It's four hundred dollars. And you talk about it, and then you make the choice going forward. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, and again, so and also con big conflicts crop up here, right? Like, no. We don't need that air filter. Yep. And so um, many couples uh, or healthy couples agree that not one person gets to unilaterally decide this. That's super hard when you only have one spouse that works. They often think that they own the control of the money in the household mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, they get to make all of the spending decisions. And um, so just deciding, you know, that we're going to decide together. And if we can't decide, we'll have a compromise or maybe we'll have like, a wise Swiss gentleman, which is one of the tools our family enterprises use when there's um, a stalemate in a decision. And it's like, we're going to agree that we're going to call, maybe it's your financial advisor or a parent or a trusted friend. Phone a friend kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Like we can't decide, all right, let's call Richard and Angela and see what they think, <laughs> you know, and then that let someone else. That happens a lot actually, right? Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. 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 We get that. Yeah. Okay. I've just a couple of days ago, you know, mm -hmm. how much home can we purchase? One spouse thinks it's more, one spouse thinks it's yep. less. Yep. And then, you know, then we put some real numbers to it and we help them compromise. Yep. Yep. Um, we've talked about a lot of areas so far. This has been great. What about um, goal setting? You know, if you don't know, it's been said, like, if you don't know where you're going, how are you going to know if you ever get there? Right. So how do you handle that part? Uh -huh. 
Well, you asked my favorite question, begin with the end in mind. Oh, so now I think right. you all heard that oh 47 gosh, times. Yep. You know, few people even ask themselves about their financial goals, um, let alone their partner. And I think some of that is a symptom of, you know, struggling to make ends meet. You, you kind of can't think about the next steps, but I really encourage you to do it because having a positive vision for where you're going with your money will help motivate you to get there. Um, and you know, our retirement goals are impacted by how much we can save as a couple and and our perspective on saving and some clients have a more modest view of what retirement will look like you know some some less so i want to be you know traveling the world and yep. and having a lot of fun and so more than just aligning your annual savings you really want to talk about your shared goals and your dreams and your vision for the future and this is a really good opportunity to to come closer together right like how wonderful is it to talk about your vision of the future and and respect your spouse's vision of the of the future, right? Like it might not be the same as yours and that's totally okay. And you can plan around some of that stuff actually. It may feel daunting, but it's actually a very uplifting conversation, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so some questions you might ask yourself are, or each other are, you know, at what age do we want to have the option to work or not? That's, especially if you're young, that's a really good question to ask because conceptualizing retiring at 60 when you're 22 is, is kind of absurd, but yep. like at what age do I want the option? And what would I do if I didn't have to work? And that question can inform how much money you're gonna spend. You know, like if I wasn't here all day, every day, I'd probably be out spending money. So much easier to have a goal early in life, right? Cause you can work towards, cause the, the actual, uh, pain you have to suffer putting money away is so much lighter than if oh my you gosh, start yes. thinking about it at 50. Yeah, you know, I you think know? we should do a show on like what happens if you start saving at 20 with, you know, $20 a month versus 50. It makes a big oh, impact in your overall even, yeah, life. It's unbelievable. Yeah. 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 It's like giving up a, giving up a couple lattes a month, a week versus, you know, giving up 90% of your income yeah. to make it work. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So once the goals are set, then what? Yeah, so uh, then you gotta figure out how you're gonna get there, right? And this is where your level of financial acumen and skills, like you have to get serious about what yeah. skills do we have? Do we know what to do? So we know we have to save some money. How much do we need to fund these retirement goals? And, and in what? If, right, where right. do we put it? And who you know, like, who helps us do it? And so, you know, if so oftentimes one partner has a skill or a unique ability in that area, and like, Obviously in my relationship, I take that on happily because I love it, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> if you do determine together that you need a financial advisor, I encourage you both to go away and make your own list of what you want from your advisor and then come back and combine those lists because often it's really different and you could find advisors who could suit those needs. Yeah, yeah. we have people that want us to do, help them be held accountable on their budgets. Mm -hmm. Other people just want us to help them with their retirement plans and all that, you know, so everybody, everybody's different. Yeah, and some like really good advisors, you know, we have some couples where one is really knowledgeable and the other one isn't. And so we spend a lot more time with the less knowledgeable partner um, teaching them and kind of leveling the playing field between the two of them. And, mm -hmm. you know, that could be a really wonderful way to move forward in all of these goals. And that, if you feel, if someone feels like they kind of don't get it and they're really reluctant to talk about it, you can make light years of, of progress. I'm thinking about one friend of ours, a client of ours who really was more you know, like art, art, artsy, you know, and very, very creative and everything, but had, wasn't very strong in financial skills. Mm -hmm. And over a period of like, you know, a couple, three years, th that person has dramatically changed their game. Yeah. And they are on it now. And they have savings accounts and they have their, you know, they're controlling their spending and they have made a shift that I, I, you would never even believe that it was the same person. It's amazing. So it's really possible if you feel like you're, you know, kind of, on the short end of the stick with that, don't give up. Yeah. You just have to work at it. Or if you're those right. spouses that are really struggling, like my, mm -hmm. my spouse is a spendthrift, I can't get her on board or him on board. Get it, you know, a financial advisor, a third party can can help. You know, like I, it, you know, a fr another couple, you know, married couple friends, We, the wife and I didn't know how to drive a stick. And, but what we decided is that we were not gonna learn how to drive a stick from our own husbands because that sounded like an argument waiting to happen. So we <laughs> no. swapped husbands for the purpose of learning how to drive a stick shift 
automobile. And, and it was really wonderful because her husband was super patient with me and I listened to him. Whereas, yeah. you know, I would have told my spouse to shut the heck up, <laughs> uh, you know, don't, don't, don't distract me. And, yeah. and it was like such a wonderful experience for both of us. And you can apply that to this as well. When I, you know, if you're giving me crap about my spending husband, I'm like, ah, shut up. But if a financial advisor is okay, I'm going to listen to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's just, it's different. Yeah. Who's the source, right? Yeah. yeah. So other mm -hmm. questions you can ask around, like, so long-term financial goals are important, but then what do we do with extra money that we might have laying around beyond those long-term goals? Mm -hmm. Decide before you have the money, because what often happens is like, oh, there's an extra 5K in the checking account. Well, I'm gonna book a flight to Hawaii. The other what? spouse can feel really like, yeah, yeah almost used, or you know, like yeah. they didn't get to have input on how to spend that For money. Sure. So decide now on what, to, what you're gonna do with surplus. Yeah. Um, you can also talk about, you know, will we be saving and investing for these goals separately or together? Um, and you know, that's kind of combined, like how you're going to do your money with your household will inform that generally. Yeah. Yeah. What about the division of labor? I mean, you don't want to have a situation I would imagine where, you know, one spouse is the slave driver and the other one is, you know, just taking orders. <laughs> how do you do that? How do you divide that yeah. up? This is deeply personal in how you do this in your relationship. Well, you know, like I said, as the financial planner in my relationship, I just took that on. Um, and then I kind of informed the spouse. And so I think, you know, you, some people split this up in like long-term planning versus short-term bill pay. That's kind of a nice way to do it. So I work with the advisor. I make sure all the savings are happening um, and then you take care of you know the day-to-day -day bill pay or you might split it up and say I'm paying these seven bills you're paying these or put them all on auto pay so no one has to do it and then regular conversations like you know like our clients that do money day they come together once a month they look at the budget they ask any questions and then they move on with their lives it's really wonderful really effective yeah yeah and if your goals align closely uh then you know one person might be okay with the other just taking care of it all i mean this is just like so deeply personal but however you decide to split it up mm -hmm. each partner should know that they can always be honest and direct with the other partner about their feelings about what's happening about their desires about what's happening so maybe you know you're running the bill pay but I'm not liking the way you're missing payments. I'm not liking the way you're doing it. There's right. always an open line of communication and a willingness to um, change things when it's not working. Like I'm feeling really burdened by the fact that I'm the only one that meets with our financial advisor. Please come to this meeting so you can understand how all of this works as well. So both really both spouses really should be in the financial planning meetings, honestly. But So ideally you're talking about people making agreements to do things for each other and then and then having to uphold them, yes. being held accountable. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. I like that. Yeah. So last question, um, what is the <clears throat> best way to come up with an estate plan mm. uh, for both part that suits both partners? You know, those, the leave it to beaver days, <laughs> they're gone. Yeah. Warden June, you know, we don't, we have the, the, the straight, you know, family that was blood gone, more blended families and lots of different, you know, situations now. What, what do you recommend to yeah. people to think about? Yeah. Regard? Yeah. So um, again, deeply personal, how you guys want to do this. But I think I would like to offer up an exercise for people to do. And I think that this should be the last thing that you do at the end of your money conversation. Um, and I want to bring everybody back to what really matters. So picture your family sitting around a campfire at the family compound in the year is 2060. Uh, the group is bigger and maybe more vibrant than you ever imagined and communication flows freely. The family appears genuinely connected and, and joyful. And so you're a fly on the wall at this proverbial gathering. I'm going to ask you some questions and these will, these will be in the show notes as well, but what are your greatest wishes for this group of people? Hmm. Who is there? What are they talking about? What is each attendee experiencing? Um, individually in their lives? And, and what is the group all about? What do you feel most grateful for? And what do you wish you could say to this group of people? Mm. If you can answer a lot of these questions before you go into a, an estate planning meeting, it will really inf like tell your lawyer how you want the money pieces to make all of this work. Um, and, and then you share that with your spouse. I mean, what a beautiful exercise to sit really around together and talk about like, you know, these two kids that we created, or in your case, these five kids that we created and, you know, the kids they create and the ones they create. And what are they all doing? Like, what does all of this mean? What is the purpose of what we're sitting around here doing? Love you it. take that to your lawyer and certainly engage a lawyer for your estate planning, um, and go from there. 
The other thing that you can do if you've written all of this down is pull it out before your next family gathering now. What can I do or what can I shift about the way that we do the, or got like Christmas, let's say, um, to make the, my dream a reality today. Like, you know, you might be undermining your own dream with the way that you behave with your children around the holidays or oh, something like call. that. Or what yeah. would I do differently right now? What a great yeah. conversation to have, right? Oh my gosh. It's so wonderful. Right, right. And then, and then finishing your money conversation on, on this topic, just, it's like a really positive note to end on and yeah. it's wonderful. So yeah. if you were embroiled in a conflict at any point, this can help repair and everybody walks away feeling, you know, really hopeful for the future of their family. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, we have time for maybe one question. Um, um, okay. What questions do we have? Uh, let me see. Uh, okay. So there's a question about, do I need a prenup? Are they good ideas? Oh my gosh. A prenup. Yeah. We got another whole, that's another whole podcast, right? Boy. But yeah. I mean, a little bit, fraught yeah, with, briefly. yeah. So um, this is where, you know, your money values and your own personal feelings about yourself and your partner really can collide. We often find parents pushing children, parents of wealthy families will push children um, to get the prenup. And then people have all of these, you know, notions about what it means. My spouse doesn't love me or they're, you know, trust me. Yeah. Or they're beginning, um, you know, assuming that we're going to fail. And I think that you can look at these conversations a little bit differently, right? Modern society, like you play the game in which in the society that you live in, this is be something realistic. We, yeah, this yeah, is something that right. we do. Prenups can also be used to manage things like debt. So if you are really worried about your spouse's debt, uh, they're, like they're coming into the marriage with a lot, you can write that into the prenup. And that could be the only thing that goes in the prenup. Like it doesn't have to be, you're never getting any alimony from me, or whatever, <laughs> yeah, right. all my assets are mine. Uh, I say that like it's wrong. If that's how you feel, that's no judgment, right? Um, but they can be, um, it's again, kind of beginning with the end in mind. It's not the ending that you want to have, but you could think through, if we get to the point where we have to pull the ripcord on this marriage, what do we want that to look like? Why don't we talk about that while we're getting along? Right. Right. And I what think that um, a lot of times these things get, it's, it, unfortunately, they get shoved down spouses' throats. Uh, like that, you know, right before you're getting married, like, by the way, you have to sign this. Like, what? You're pulling this out, you know, at the last, at the 11th it's hour. It's really common. It's really hard, you know, but but there are, like you said, there's really valid reasons for doing it. And if, it, if people can understand and hear each other, it can be a lot different experience. I We, we know of one uh, spouse who, had the, had a prenup shoved down their throat mm -hmm. and for the next 30 years they resented it and they used every opportunity they could find to shove it in the rest of the family's face the parents the in-laws you know everybody the spouse the yeah. you know and it just becomes it's it could have been done so much more intelligently and emotionally with you know high eq so that it was mm -hmm. it actually was something constructive yeah. And I mean, in that case, they pushed it down her throat at the last minute. But then also, you know, she made a choice to continue to resent throughout the marriage. And right. so if you find yourself in that position, reconsider whether or not you want to marry into that family and probably seek counseling yeah, at that point for, sure. for yourself. For Good sure. question. Yeah, that's yeah. a tough one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, that wraps it up for today. Thank you. It was a really good conversation. Thank you. It's really fun will, to talk about this. Have, we'll really get a lot out of this. And don't forget, we have this in our in our show notes, and it's on our website and our blog. Um, and make sure you grab that. And um, we have our free book offer that we still are offering. If you love that that last part about oh. the family conversation and you know the campfire in in uh, forty years. Um, this book will help you get there. Yeah. You know, there's a lot more like that in this book as well. If you want to think about your family yeah, in that way. Yeah. So let us know, send it, send an email to info at, at place of and mm. we will send you a free book. Um, also, if you'd like a 30 minute, a free 30 minute con consultation with either, either Angela or I, or both of us, you can also get that through our website. We have a calendar. You can make appointments for yourself. And uh, the last thing is tune in in two weeks where we hope we're hoping to speak about geopolitical strife where we're hoping to have an expert uh, yet to be announced yet on that because mm. we, we know people are wor worried about ukraine and what's happening in russia and all that and other you know asia taiwan mm. things like that mm -hmm. so we want to address that for people um and so 
be on the lookout for that. Yeah, it should be a really great show. Yeah, it should be fun. Thank you yeah. so much for being with us today. Yes, we really appreciate it. And Good we luck with your conversations. Really. Absolutely. <laughs> Write to us and let us know how they're going. Uh, we'd love to know. Yeah, right? and also, if you have another way of managing your family's finances, put it in the comments. I would love to hear about it and learn from you. Absolutely, absolutely. So, until next time, remember, you're invested and so are we.